First, first of all, I would like to thank uh, all of you for being with us today. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure. Oops. Uh, one of uh, 400 university professors who have uh, publicly uh, supported our institute and our struggle to preserve uh, institutional autonomy last spring. Uh, his support was uh, something extraordinary for us. Uh, he helped us a lot to win this struggle and I take uh, this opportunity to thank him once again. Initially, it was planned that uh, Yanis would come to Belgrade for this presentation, but because of the sanitary situation, this was not possible. Anyway, we are extremely happy to be welcoming uh, him uh, today at our institute, uh, even by Zoom. Uh, the event will be divided into two parts. Uh, we will start with a 20-minute uh, talk given by Yanis, followed by a 40-minute time uh, slot for um, discussions with uh, the audience. Uh, as you may, may have uh, noticed in our announcement, uh, Yanis will address an issue that is very interesting and important in the current uh, context, namely uh, the coming of freedom in times between authoritarianism. Uh, but before I hand it over uh, to him, uh, I would just like to briefly introduce our guest today. Born in uh, uh, 1961, uh, Yanis Varoufakis left for England in the early uh, 1980s after the end of the colonel's dictatorship. Uh, he studied mathematics and statistics applied to economics at the University of Essex. He taught at Cambridge, among other places. Uh, in 1990s, during uh, Margaret Thatcher's third term, uh, it was too much, he said. He then uh, moved to Sydney, Australia where he taught during 12 years at the University of Sydney. Back in Greece, um, where he teaches at the University of Athens, uh, he's uh, one of the first uh, to say that uh, we must accept the bankruptcy of Greece. Uh, this earned him the nickname uh, Monsieur Catastrophe or Dr. Doom. He became uh, between 2004 and 2006, uh, imprudently but quite officially, he said, uh, advisor to Yorgos Papandreou, uh, before becoming one of his most vigorous critics. He once said uh, uh, that his relentless anti-austerity rhetoric led him to leave Greece uh, under threats uh, and to go into exile in uh, 2011 in Austin, Texas, where he has been teaching since 2013. Uh, on the other hand, uh, he has uh, seduced uh, the Syriza party and in the early elections of January 2015, uh, he was elected deputy under the label of Syriza, but without being a member of that party. He was appointed Minister of Finance in the government uh, of Alexis Tsipras on the 27th of January 2015. On July 6, uh, 2015, he resigned as a Finance Minister following the July 5th uh, referendum. In February 2016, uh, Varoufakis initiated the Pan-European DiEM 25 movement, and in March uh, 2018, he founded a new political party, the European Realistic Disobedience Front, which became a member of DiEM25. Uh, this party won nine seats in the uh, 2019 Greek parliamentary elections. Today, uh, Yanis Varoufakis is a member of the Greek parliament, a professor of economics at uh, the University of Athens, um, honorary professor of political economy at uh, the University of Sydney, honorary professor of law, uh, economics and finance at the University of Turin, distinguished visiting professor of political economy at King's College, University of Lon London, and author of, if I'm uh, correct, uh, 14 books. Uh, I would also recommend uh, seeing a wonderful movie uh, directed by uh, Costa Gavras, a legendary Greek-French uh, filmmaker based on Yanis' book, Adults in the Room. Uh, before I give uh, the floor to Yanis, a word to our uh, director, Gazela Puder Drashko. I will be very brief because he would <laughs> extend this quite a lot. I just want you to greet all on behalf of the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory at the University of Belgrade and also on behalf of our partner in organizing this series, Horizons of Freedom, Center for Advanced Studies at the University of Rijeka. We are really happy to have you all here. And basically the idea behind this series uh, came out uh, as a result of the situation which we had in the past uh, almost two years where our academic freedom basically was threatened. We were uh, luckily, <laughs> we managed to uh, overcome this uh, uh, issue and now we are uh, in position to organize this uh, uh, series of events and I'm really happy that we can have Yanis with us uh, as second in a row basically in, in the series. 
Thank you, Gazella. Just a clarification. If you want to ask uh, a question to Yanis, you have to let us know in the chat, please, by writing us the message, of course. Then at the end of Yanis' presentation, I will let you ask your question in person. Uh, Evaristo Poli, dear Yanis, uh, the word is finally yours. Thank you so much, Ivica. Thank you, Gazella. It's um, wonderful to be um, even remotely with you. I wish I could be in Belgrade. The news that your institute has been rendered safe by the mobilization that um, you are uh, energized um, is splendid news for all of us. I shall speak to my title because the word authoritarianism is in there. You experienced it and you had to defend your institute from authoritarianism. Uh, I was born in a fascist dictatorship, very close to where you are, you know, to the south of uh, former Yugoslavia, of Serbia. Uh, we know in our bones, <clears throat> you know, what authoritarianism is about. Nevertheless, this is a, a strange era in which we are living. And uh, the weirdness of it has to do with the fact that we live in conditions of what I call in the title a twin authoritarianism, a kind of clash between two very different varieties of authoritarianism. And that is um, a strange state to be in. Uh, when I was growing up, um, the authoritarianism was uh, effectively unitary. You could see it, you could see the uniforms of the you know, military uniforms of the announcers on television. Um, you knew who the enemy was, who was the conveyor of authoritarianism. Uh, similarly, when you're fighting your struggle to keep um, free ideas floating in your university, again, it's fairly clear who is trying to curtail those freedoms and to exercise authoritarianism. But, if you look at the European Union today, which is supposed to be the realm of democracy and liberalism, uh, you have two authoritarianisms. And I'll be very precise and succinct and to the point. Uh, here in Greece, where I'm speaking to, uh, to you from, we have all the paraphernalia of democracy. We have a free press. Uh, we don't have a secret police that, um, you know, can uh, make me disappear in the middle of the night. But at the same time, uh, we are in a regime where my parliament, the parliament to which I belong, makes no decisions, effectively. All the decisions have been taken by unknown and unseen people somewhere in Frankfurt, in Brussels. Uh, we have um, um, a remarkable transfer of wealth from the Greek state and from Greek private persons to unknown, unseen, shadowy um, vultures, you know, funds with an, you know, registration address in Delaware or New Jersey or Luxembourg that um, you know, now own Greek banks without even the Greeks knowing that, taking um, you know, the homes of families uh, by means of processes that no one really understands or has um, affected. I remember when I was uh, representing Greece as the Minister of Finance in the Eurogroup, supposedly a European Union institution uh, of equals, of ministers of finance that get together uh, in the context of uh, mutual respect. And I remember when I presented my assessment of um, you know, the bankruptcy of the Greek state, it was bankrupt since 2010. It remains bankrupt today. And I put forward some proposals for changing the policies, um, the economic policies of the European Union, so as to uh, render the, you know, uh, 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 the Greek state solvent again. And the German finance minister stood up, actually didn't stand up, but took the floor and said um, that, you know, democratic elections uh, may elect new governments, but that does not mean that elections can influence or change economic policy, which is a remarkable uh, statement in a democracy. 
the statement elections cannot change policy uh, is um, um, you know, the definition of contradiction when it comes to a democratic uh, regime, supposedly. So this is not a form of authoritarianism. It's an authoritarianism that is legitimized through elections, uh, but at the same time has the capacity of annulling elections without actually annulling them legally. These are, if you want, the two authoritarianisms. On the one hand, you have the authoritarianism of a fascist uh, who gains power by offering discontented people the promise of um, the restoration of their dignity. That's what Mussolini did in the 1920s. He looked at Italians, poor Italians, middle class or lower middle class Italians, and said to them, I will make you proud again. Remember that? It's what you know, Donald Trump successfully says to many disenchanted Americans, to what Le Pen says in France, to what I'm sure some authoritarian politicians in your country say, to what the fascists and the Nazis were saying and still say here in Greece, I'll make you proud again, just give me absolute authority. I'll get rid of all the foreigners or the gays or the riffraff of those liberals, uh, the communists and so on. But give me extreme power and I will make you proud again. Okay? And I will look after you too. I will give you a higher pensions. And often they did. Remember, the first pension, universal pension system was introduced in Europe, not by social democrats, but by Mussolini's fascists. Um, so, the, yeah, that's one authoritarianism. But there is the other authoritarianism, which I refer to. The authoritarianism of, of big business, of business as usual, which hides behind the vestiges of um, social democracy or of liberal democracy and ensures that the demos is never part of the democracy, that the demos has taken, been taken out of the democracy and all decisions are turned into the technocratic processes ruled over by a technocracy that pretends to know best and pretends to be above politics and therefore above collective decision-making, democracy. If you think about it, both in the United States and in the European Union, ever since we had the massive financial uh, crisis of 2008, we had this uh, clash between these two authoritarianisms. Uh, why was Macron elected in France? Because of Le Pen. The threat of the neo-fascist Le Pen is what made Macron president. Pres Macron would never have been elected if it wasn't for the neo-fascist threat. So, in a sense, while I have no doubt that Emmanuel Macron, I know him personally, I actually like him personally, even though I disagree with him entirely politically, Emmanuel Macron loathes Marine Le Pen. There's no doubt about that. Personally, loathes Marine Le Pen. Um, but that does not mean that he does not owe to Le Pen the fact that he's president. And I have no doubt that Marine Le Pen loathes Emmanuel Macron, but she must have, you know, his picture next to her bedside every night and you know, blow him a kiss and you know, make a little prayer for him. Because if it was not for the austerity policies and the liberal authoritarianism of, of politicians like Macron, then the neo-fascist movement would not be what it is. It would not have the support that it manages to have. So similar in the United States. Look at what's happened in this election that um, is still ongoing. Uh, we had, on the one hand, a proto-fascist, racist president, Donald Trump, who looked into the eyes of the discontented, of those who were left behind, thrown into the margin, living a life of despair in the Midwest, in a place like Pennsylvania, uh, people who've lost their jobs, uh, who used to be proud blue-collar workers, uh, who used to vote for you know, Obama or Reagan or uh, Clinton, for that matter, uh, and who were treated by the liberal establishment, the big business, Wall Street, Hollywood, you know, Silicon Valley, like vermin. They were treated like, um, you know, like cattle, like cows that lost their market value. 
And Donald Trump goes to them and says, I'll make you proud again. You know, you are my kind of person. Uh, I may be a millionaire myself or billionaire, whatever, but I'm going to look after you. Uh, and uh, you know, all those people who speak on your behalf from the Democratic Party, they really can't give a damn. They will never do anything that jeopardizes their immense concentration of wealth and power. And the tragedy is that Trump is not a liar. He's something far, far worse than that. There's something worse than being a liar. Uh, if you come from that milieu of the authoritarian ultra-right, telling important truths. A lot of what Trump says is the truth. Uh, and which, of course, he mixes with gigantic lies. This is, if you want, straight out of Goebbels' manual for propaganda. But if you want to tell big lies, you mix them with a myriad of small truths and you keep repeating them. This, so this is, you know, the authoritarian Donald Trump who comes and says, you know, I don't care about democracy, uh, I don't, uh, I'm, trade unions, get rid of them, but I'm going to look after the poor people. And you know what? He has looked after them a lot more than the Democrats had. You know, let, let, this, this is another truth that we progressives must, must admit to. You know, he tore up the North Atlantic Free Trade uh, Association Treaty. He just tore it up um, and replaced it with another one, which has a clause in there, which I'm not sure that many people know about. Instead of introducing tariffs on goods produced in Mexico to be shipped to the United States or to be uh, transferred to the United States, you know what he did? He did something that I would have liked to do. He imposed on the Mexican government a minimum hourly wage of 15 American dollars an hour for Mexican workers in North Mexico saying to Volkswagen General Motors, if you want to produce a car in Mexico and bring it over to the United States, okay, at least you'll have to pay very high salaries to the Mexican workers. That way, he also defended jobs of blue collar workers in the United States. But fascists always did that. Fascists you know, offered people a social contract. Make me invincible, give me absolute power, and I will look after you. That, we have to remember that. Um, and then you have the other side, you know, Biden. Biden is, of course, a non-entity. Uh, he can't even remember the name of his grandchildren. Um, he's uh, simply there because he's not Bernie Sanders, because he's not a radical progressive. The greatest utility for the establishment of, of Biden is that he's going to do exactly as the establishment tells him to do. But he will do it with all the right language politeness, you know, great narratives about inclusion, about tolerance, about racial harmony, about feminism, about all those things, but he will never do anything that undermines the power grids that push workers, women, gays into the margin. Now, and this is how I'm going to you know, conclude so that we can have an interesting conversation, because I've spoken about the twin authoritarianisms. What I have not spoken about yet, is what I refer to as the canning of freedom, which of course is my expression, you're philosophers. Um, I have nicked it from Hegel, uh, who speaks about the canning of reason, but I you know, sort of alter it a bit. I edit it by referring to the canning of freedom, but again in a Hegelian kind of way, way because I am referring effectively to Hegel's master-slave paradox. This wonderful idea that you know, freedom is uh, impossible to define in an analytic way. What does it mean to be free? Uh, does it mean simply to serve your preferences, your desires? Uh, anyone who thinks that has a very, very low opinion of liberty. Um, but at the same time, if you want to offer an alternative definition to freedom, uh, unless it is a poetic one, uh, if you try for an analytical definition of freedom, again, you, you end up with a form of unfreedom and lack of autonomy, which completely misses the point about what it means to be free as a human being. And the beauty of this um, um, indefinable or non-deterministic, indeterminate notion of freedom is that, you know, at least even in the darkest hours of living in authoritarian regimes, we know that our freedom cannot be annulled. 
this is the whole point about the master-slave paradox, is it not? That you know, a master that is all-powerful, who demands that the slave respects him, which I'm not going to say him, I'm not going to say him or her, respects him, right? Uh, is always going to be frustrated because if he has all this power to force the slave to respect him, then this respect is not particularly valuable to him because it, it was natural. It, um, it was coerced. So the more power the master has over the slave, the greater the capacity of the slave to subvert the power of the master by frustrating the master's need to be respected, uh, some, a need that can never be satisfied because of his immense power which means that it can never be genuine. In other words, the master, you know, this canning of freedom, what I you know, call the canning of freedom, is a fantastic source, at least for me personally, of hope that however bleak the world we live in may be, and however authoritarian our society, we shall always retain access to freedom and the potential for subverting authoritarianism. Except that when you have twin authoritarianisms, that gets harder. The canning of freedom becomes blunted. Because good people, when they are confronted with a Donald Trump, they think, oh, it can't be worse to vote for Biden. Let's have Biden. It can't be worse. There's a, a degree of truth in this. But then you fall in for another variety of authoritarianism. And the worst unfreedom occurs when good people are buffeted between these two different forms of authoritarianism and fall prey to this um, uh, fake opposition. The only way of retaining our hope and retaining access to the possibility of freedom, is by rejecting this false antinomy, this false conflict between Trump and Biden, Macron and Le Pen, the liberal establishment form of authoritarianism and the nationalist racists form of authoritarianism. To see them for what they are, part of the same problem, effectively collaborators, needing one another and for us to unite as progressives across borders in total opposition to the twin authoritarianisms, to both authoritarianisms as one. This is what has guided my politics, my philosophy. This is why we have created the Democracy in Europe movement, uh, DiEM25. This is why DiEM25, together with Bernie Sanders, and other uh, friends and comrades and collaborators. We created the Progressive International because we need to bind forces independently of you know, our um, differences when it comes to our philosophies about what constitutes the good society. Uh, together to oppose both varieties of authoritarianism, together to give life and energy to the canning of freedom against those two authoritarianisms that form one single unitary twin authoritarianism. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yanis, uh, for this uh, inspiring lecture. Uh, if you agree, we can uh, take some questions from the audience. Um, of we have three uh, persons with uh, questions, and uh, I will let in to speak. Uh, first one, uh, Philip uh, Golub. Uh, uh, thank you, Philip. Please introduce uh, yourself uh, and uh, let us hear your question. Greetings to all. Thank you to the Institute for having organized this session, and thank you, uh, yeah, Yanis Varoufakis, for uh, presenting your thoughts to us today. I have, I'm a professor of international politics and international political economy at the American University of Paris and a long-standing collaborator of Le Monde Diplomatique. And I have followed very closely and very intensely the struggle that occurred over the past uh, 10 years uh, over the imposition of indeed author authoritarian auster austerity politics in Europe. 
My question is the following, is that your discourse, which I concur with and that I adhere to, begs the question, begs the question of uh, relations, society state relations. And because the problem of freedom, uh, traditionally in liberal political thought has always been the problem of removing the state from the sphere of intervention into society and making the state into a night watchman state that only takes care of police functions and market regulation mechanisms. Clearly, we have to, in, in struggling against the twin authoritarianism that you have outlined, we need to think through what kind of state forms can, can, can be established that actually secure individual freedoms and collective freedoms simultaneously in our society. In other words, to build a state society relationship that actually is a democratic state society relationship, which you did, you, you, your, your talk was very short, but which you did address. And I would like you to address that. And I was thinking, I was thinking this in terms of Polanyi, Karl Polanyi's discussion in the last chapters of the Great Transformation about how to build a democratic society in, under conditions of solidarity with strong interventionist states simultaneously guaranteeing social solidarity and social equality. So to bring together the problem of freedom and equality, I think is an essential task both of political philosophy today in the struggle against those twin authoritarianism, as well as a more practical task, a task of, a task of praxis in our societies today. Well, Philip, thank you so much. Um, of course, it's uh, the pressing question, the one you, you, you posited. Uh, of course, we know that the neoliberal mantra of uh, a state that withers, a state that shrinks and allows the market and individuals to flourish, that was always uh, subterfuge. That was never even intended by those who were advocating it. Margaret Thatcher was famously advocating it, uh, but when she left 10 Downing Street, as we all know, the state was bigger, stronger, far more authoritarian, and uh, less liberal than it was when she took over. That's what, what happens when any neoliberal enters government, uh, using the narrative of um, neoliberalism uh, and of the state that shrinks, this, what they do is the effect policies that ensure that the state gets bigger. And the reason why they must do that is in order to do what they really want to do, which is massive transfer of power and wealth from the many to the few, they need to, to bolster the capacity of the state uh, to impose this uh, redistribution of wealth upon the many. Um, so, yes, um, we, we have two duties. One is to expose the lie of the neoliberal project. And the second one is to answer your question, why they were doing it. Uh, what kind of state do we want? Uh, how do we envisage the relationship, as you put it, between state and society? The... Que th th this question, I, um, of course, is um, you know, a difficult one. And if I may be allowed to plug my latest book, a book that I published last month in, um, in London, uh, it's called Another Now. And it's got a subtitle, Dispatches from an Alternative Present. It's a novel uh, it's, uh, using science fiction. And the reason I'm mentioning this is not to plug the book per se, but to answer your question, or in answering your question, to say that I tried to create a blueprint, a kind of utopic blueprint of the relationship between the state and society that I would think is consistent with uh, a genuine democracy, a genuine political and economic democracy. So in another now, I effectively sketch out um, a society with the, uh, the same constraints that we face, technological, uh, environmental, human, uh, that works differently. So let me tell you what, if you read this book, uh, your takeaway will be. Uh, firstly, there is no way we can civilize a state and democratize it without um, a radical transformation of the economic realm of the economic and financial realm. 
we know this from uh, social democracy. Social democracy reached its limits and then died because uh, of the impossibility of civilizing capitalism without changing uh, property rights over means of production, as we Marxists used to say. So to make an abstract point more concrete, uh, let me tell you what happens in another now. In another now, we have um, ended the share market. We've terminated the share market. Very simply, we change corporate law. Corporations, and that is something that citizens of the former Yugoslavia will have much to talk about. Um, I close the, the parenthesis here. Um, it, corporate law in another now has been tran transformed so that um, by law, anyone who works in any company uh, owns one share in that company that cannot be traded and which grants that person one vote in the General Assembly of the company. Imagine if you were to do that. Huh? Every, everyone working for Google owns one share in Google uh, and no one else can own shares except full-time workers in Google. And every single share gives an employee of Google one vote. Well, suddenly there's no share market because you know shares are no longer tradable, like votes are not trad tradable, you know, and, or shouldn't be tradable <laughs> in our political liberal democracies. And imagine simultaneously you have the central bank granting every citizen um, a free digital bank account. If you do those two things, you know, one share, one person, one vote, and a free digital bank account for everybody provided by the central bank, suddenly financialized capitalism disappears. You have markets, you have corporations, you have, um, you know, markets for goods and services. You even have the possibility that, you know, um, you and I can form a, a little bank and you know, if we have some extra cash, we can lend it to other people through the ledger, the digital ledger of our central bank. But uh, the banking sector and financialization, financial markets simply disappear. Suddenly, you have markets without capitalism and you have corporations that are self-managed. Suddenly, you have a huge dis redistribution of power uh, from the, the ultra rich, you can even let them keep their money. But by ending share markets and the financial markets, they will no longer have a capacity to keep amassing more wealth. So, in, you know, in the long run, they will simply disappear as, um, you know, uh, ultra powerful, ultra rich players. Um, and then we can start discussing ways in which the self-managed model of corporations can be extended to municipalities, to you know, the national theater, to uh, the way in which we run our regions, our counties, uh, even uh, parliaments. So in another now, I have envisaged a situation where you know, uh, two thirds of parliamentarians are chosen by lot, by lottery, not through elections. Because let me remind you, in ancient Athens, the Democrats loathed elections because the Democrats understood that elections can always be usurped and are always usurped by the oligarchy. The oligarchs loved elections in ancient Athens. Um, this is why during the, the most democratic phase of ancient Athens, there were no elections. Every um, position was decided by lottery, except two positions. The general, who had to know something about war, uh, and the banker, who always was a slave. And I think we should retrieve that idea of the, the you know, the, the central banker should be a slave. And there, you know why they had slaves as the central bankers in ancient Athens, because slaves could be beaten <laughs> if they stole the money, whereas citizens could not. Uh, okay, that's a bit of an extreme suggestion, but you know where I'm getting at. So I think that, to, to cut a long story short, um, Philip, we cannot talk about a democratic society without uh, you know, being ambitious and thinking of ways of ending capitalism. Thank you so much, Yanis. Um, uh, uh, here is another question from Jeffrey White. Uh, I'm trying to unmute you. Uh, now you're in, Jeffrey. 
Hi, Jeffrey. Wait, I hear you. Hi. Wow. Okay, now, now, now you can hear me. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, this, I, it was really great. I loved listening to that because it, um, I, I'm going to post a link, as I'd mentioned earlier, to this paper written by Matthew Radcliffe and Ian Kidd, and they're talking about how there's no discussion about controversial subjects. This is all shut down in a contemporary era, and the way you were able to talk about, I, I have some notes, the master and slave, and, and I was, I, I, I just wanted to comment, I liked how you were able to, you, it seems that you were saying that the more dependent the master becomes on the slave, then of course is less free and, uh, and more vulnerable, right? So anyways, it's really great because, yeah, I guess um, what I want to come to is finally, I was going to go through all this stuff. Uh, there's this, you know, you have this thing, Hegelian theme, the polarization I see there between the thesis and antithesis, and you have this sort of synthesis you're aiming for. You have this picture of a utopia. You have, you have your own vision of what might work. Many other people might have theirs, and of course, we have to converge on something like that, uh, and then not only converge on something like that, but uh, in, in an agreement, but then work towards it maybe over many generations long, right? So we, in transforming this economy so that the people who enjoy the leisure actually do the work of taking care of every, in, in this case, we do it because we're all invested in your solution, right? Which is ultimately the, the best thing. We, we don't have to be, we don't have to try to teach civic virtue anymore because we have to live in the consequences of our actions, right? We, the trouble is if everybody's in a Google, then they live in a walled off bubble and Google, if I work for Google, I might not live in your neighborhood and I might have a bad impact on you somehow we have to picture this everybody has a share in the earth on that model it seems like i know i'm rambling on here it's really great and uh, there's a lot to talk about but um i my and my my asking i want to come back a bit to poliani i guess in this instance too in the role of technology maybe um do you see a role for information communication technologies and maybe even ai for predictive models simulations in an open platform accessible because it's graphical, maybe based in natural energetics, you know, from maybe the free energy principle and the understanding of psychi psychiatry these days, right? So we can ground things in entropy. There's an ancient Greek uh, metaphysic, right? That uh, all of nature, I think it's uh, all of nature is moving towards understanding and we're just part of that. Uh, we're trying to construct orders from apparent disorders, and that's what people are born into now is fucked up mess. Is there a role for these technologies, these kinds of simulations to provide platforms so people can test policies going forward in the future over days and generations? I can see the impacts of my own daily activities on the way that society is gonna look in a day or in a generations using these kinds of simulation technologies. And then that opens up the field of view to the people who own these shares in the earth, like you're talking about. We can agree on the utopia, and then we can try to plot our movement there using these sorts of different levels of organization over different scales of time. Do you, do you follow me? It's a, it's, a, it's a big idea, but uh, I was wondering if you did see in a, a role in your own work, if you had thought about that, the role for ubiquitous computing, information computing, this social media drives us apart, but it can easily, if developed in the right ways, we have a platform to build consensus so people feel more control because you can see what might happen. When we can talk about the simulations, we can have discourse about what grounds them, then people understand better about themselves because <laughs> models are built on psychiatric models of self and so then all this stuff gets sorted out and it gives a, a, a theater there you know it's better to have a virtual I, I always say I'd rather see kids playing video games that are violent than out there doing something like that I mean it's better you can you can test these kinds of worlds and not risk the real can, thing is my point we can, um, we have, to have be you thought about those kinds of potentials I'm sorry I talked too much about technology there um, you, can un you can unmute me now. Thank you so much for offering me the, the floor and the chance to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, look, um, for decades, I resisted writing anything like another now, you know, putting my own thoughts about how democratic socialism could work on paper. Um, it's just too hard to do. And, um, you know, Karl Marx didn't write, 
<laughs> he always avoided talking about communism. He always talked about capitalism. And whenever he was asked about communism, you know, that's for, for the revolutionaries to, to decide what kind of society they want to create. Uh, but, you know, um, 130 years later, uh, especially after the, our sequential and serial defeats as leftists, uh, as a result of have, having created um, dystopias ourselves, right? We have created, in the name of progressive politics, we have created gulags. We have created massacres. We are you know, guilty of uh, a great deal of authoritarianism ourselves. And I'm talking about the left now. Uh, it's important to be able to answer the question, okay, mate, if you don't like capitalism, what's the alternative? because we've had several alternatives. We had the Soviet alternative, we had the Yugoslav alternative, we had social democracy, we had this, that, and the other. And um, now it is impossible to mobilize people unless we can give them an idea of what they are mobilizing to create. And of course, you know, each one of us has different ideas of what this blueprint should be like Maybe if you ask me next week, I will have a different idea to one, the one I'm having today. But it is important to, you know, as an exercise, as a mental exercise, a, a moral exercise, a political exercise, an economic exercise, to sit down and try to, you know, map out what uh, the socioeconomic arrangements would be of a society um, that's um, um, that, that, that deserves our struggle to create. Uh, so I, I, I put this together. This is why I wrote it. Um, uh, by the way, um, the, the whole point, as I see it, is once each one of us has thought about what would we like to, to do, yeah? what should we do about labor markets? How are we going to fund the green transition? What, what about gender relations? You know, how do we reconfigure domestic labor? How do we reconfigure you know, international finance, international trade? You know, if we don't like the way things are done today, how should they be done? Once we all have thought about that, then we should get together uh, and discuss a common program. Because, you know, the problem with progressive politics, I can tell you that, and that in involves your country as well, is that usually what happens, uh, I'm talking now as a politician just for one mo brief moment. I'm, I have not been speaking as a politician so far, but now I will just for a very brief, brief moment. You know, I have people from various political parties in Serbia, in Croatia, in Germany, in Portugal, and say, uh, look, look, let's form an alliance. And I, I also ask them to do what? Okay, let's say we agree on whom we don't like. We don't like Le Pen, we don't like this, that, the other. But what are we going to tell voters what is our program what what is our blueprint then suddenly they don't want to know because it's just too hard and you know they ha they have disagreements amongst themselves so they don't want to sit around the table and come up with a common program of what needs to be done and i just you know i lose the will to live when they want when politicians approach us and they want an alliance without a common program so a common program must be the result of you know, merging our utopic blueprints. Um, on the question of technology and artificial intelligence and uh, IT and so on and so forth, it's a weapon. We have to use it. You know, the other side is using it. Uh, we have to use it. Um, in another now, I have a chapter, that was a word, the, the hardest chapter to write, where I, because it's science fiction, right? Uh, I have to explain how the revolution took place, how capitalism was overthrown. Uh, and there I, I ended up writing a story of how rebels took over the machinery of uh, uh, you know, Silicon Valley, the software, uh, financial engineering, how they used the financial engineering of hedge funds in order to bring down Goldman Sachs. Um, so unless we use artificial intelligence, unless we use, use financial engineering, we will not be able to have, um, um, you know, a, a bloodless revolution that effectively forces the system just to collapse. Um, one last point, if I may. I am convinced and I'll tell you when I was convinced. I was convinced on the 12th of, 12th of August, last August, 
I can pinpoint the moment when I had this, what I consider an epiphany, a moment of realization of something which I think is substantial. When I was convinced that capitalism has transcended itself, it has overthrown itself, it was that we have already moved to a kind of post-capitalism, a kind of post-capitalism. That was the 12th of August. Look, I'm an economist, I can't help myself. I think in economic terms, right? What happened on the 12th of August was, um, I, you know, when I wake up in the morning, I immediately switch on the BBC and uh, read the Financial Times. Why? Because, you know, that's how, uh, you know, I'm used to be doing that, it's habit. Um, and I, I, I had the astonishing news from London that at 9.05 in the morning, five minutes past nine, there was an announcement by the government, by the statistical service, the Office of National Statistics to be precise, that the British economy had suffered the worst slump in its history. They had fallen 22%, 21% of, you know, in terms of GDP in the first seven months of 2020. Now, that's a gigantic collapse, more than 20% of GDP over a few months, right? And that was 9.05. 9.13, a few minutes later, the English Stock Exchange, the London Stock Exchange, the FTSE share index, shot up by 2%. And I thought, no, that, that, that's not ha happy. It's like being um, exposed to the fact that gravity does not work. That, you know, I, I throw this pen and instead of going down, it goes up. For me, it was that, that moment of truth. You have the worst collapse of the economy announced, much greater than was predicted by financiers. And then what do they do? They, get, they say, yes, let's go and buy shares. Right? The opposite should be happening. Why did they do that? It was illogic to it. It was not illogical. It was perfectly logical. Because what they thought was, ah, things are going down the toilet. Capitalism is collapsing. So the central bank is going to print huge quantities of money and give it to us to buy shares. So we'll have more shares to play with. So we'll buy shares. Now, that's not capitalism the way we understood it. That's post-capitalism. The world of money has decoupled from factories, shops, businesses, from you know, really existing capitalism. And we have a complete disconnect between profits that are below zero and the rents ex ex extracted by the financiers. Yeah, you have noticed that over the last year, you know, capitalism is, 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 is collapsing, but financial markets are doing very well, thank you. This decoupling of wealth creation by the financiers on the back of the state. And capitalist profits means we are no longer in Das Kapital Volume 1. You know, the capitalism that Marx described is no longer with us. We're in a different space. So the, the point I'm making, if, if I may, uh, and I know I'm digressing, but I think it's an important point, is that we are already in post-capitalism. But unfortunately, it's a dystopic um, kind of feudalism. It's a techno-feudalism. We have, you know, the great apps of Silicon Valley, artificial intelligence that Jeffrey has been referring to, but combined with a reversal to a kind of feudalism. I call it techno-feudalism. This is what has followed capitalism, or not socialism, unfortunately, okay? It's a kind of techno-feudalism, which is also part and parcel of the twin authoritarianism that I was talking about before. So, yes, we need to, to, to take control of the technologies and utilize them in order to turn this variety of dystopic post-capitalism into a democratic post-capitalism. Thank you, Yanis. Um, Tiago uh, Carvalhas has um, such an interesting question. Tiago, you are in. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. OK. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the floor. And thank you very much for your talk, Yanis and to everyone here. Um, my question is, uh, uh, in the beginning of your speech, you said uh, Trump says uh, small truths and then he mixes it with uh, big lies. And you also said, uh, for example, that uh, Mussolini, Mussolini introduced the, the first pension fund. Uh, uh, it, I, am I correct you said that? Yeah. Okay, but he also introduced, he also reintroduced uh, child labor and he also uh, 
uh, forbid uh, labor unions and persecute these political adversaries. So it's yes. So it seems that uh, this is uh, a very effective tactic, you know, to uh, say small uh, uh, truths and uh, big lies at the same time, and also introducing. Uh, small progressive politics and at the same time very reactionary politics and I wonder uh, how can we effectively combat this uh, I would like to have your take on it and and um, also if you permit I don't want to be very long but I was uh, hearing uh, what w- you were saying about uh, your book another now that I, I didn't read uh, but I would like to share a quote from uh, 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 Keynes, who says, uh, um, capitalism is not a success. It's not intelligent. It's not beautiful. It's not just. It's not virtuous. And it doesn't deliver the goods. In short, we dislike it. And we are beginning to despise it. But when we wonder what to put it in its place, we are ex- extremely perplexed. And I think this is our moment, our moment actually, that uh, we can identify all the all these problems, but uh, we still don't have um, a model. Uh, and I also have to say that um, I think we should, uh, and I wonder if you agree, that we should look back also to the models that didn't uh, work, like uh, um, the Soviet Union. Because uh, I, I think I agree with you when you say that these um, models failed big, but I think also that um, communism and these models all, always appear in very, uh, um, uh, very difficult material conditions because they always arise when people are very oppressed and uh, then they have very much difficulties to to get in practice. So um, I wonder if uh, we should not disregard these models like the Leninist model. We, we should look back at them and see, because th- th- these were the first, um, I would say, successfully um, tries to, to do some kind of, of, of alternative model to capitalism. And uh, that's my question. That it's two questions, and thank you very much. Well, thank you. Um, okay, um, yeah, you are absolutely right about Mussolini, about all the fascists. That's what they do. What they say, it's a, it's a kind of, it's paternalism. It is exactly the opposite of democracy. It's, you know, the, the Padre Padrone says, uh, okay, here's the deal. Uh, you do as you're told, you know. Uh, I, I will um, not tolerate any back talk, you know, you have no voice, so no trades unions, no democracy, but I will look after you. I will not let you starve. I'm not going to cast you out, cast you out into the street. I'm not going to repossess your home. Yeah, this is, this is Donald Trump today in the United States. Um, you know, one of the great frustrations of the Democratic Party during the last four years, uh, something that most people don't know, is that, you know, when they would attack tr- Trump, the administration, for giving all the money to the rich through corporate tax reductions and so on. Uh, and then they would say, um, uh, no, you shouldn't give it to the rich. You should, um, you know, strengthen Medicare or, you know, give a little bit more money to the poor. So, you know, Trump would turn around and say, okay, that's fine. <laughs> because he didn't care about austerity. You know, he was completely free, happy to, you know, to say, all right, increase the deficit. I don't care. Unlike what's happening in the European Union, unlike what Clinton and Obama were doing, who were very worried about, uh, you know, balancing the budget and so on. So, the, yeah, this is a, so, but the, your question is, okay, so how do we combat this? And the answer is, uh, has to be negative and positive. The negative part of the answer is what we should not be doing. And that is what the Democrats are doing in the United States, who treat Trump supporters as if they are vermin, who treat them with contempt. This is what we should never do. We should never turn around to somebody and say, you know, uh, what kind of a monster are you to have voted for Trump, for Le Pen, for Salvini? We should never, we should treat people with respect. Uh, especially l- people that we of the left have left behind, have ignored, have uh, uh, allowed 
effectively to be to fall prey uh, to the predators of big capital. Um, you know, Hillary Clinton referred to them as deplorables. She is deplorable, right? Num number one, treat them with respect. You know, people in Britain who voted for Brexit, they didn't care about the European Union. They just wanted to punish the establishment um, for having ignored them for so many decades. You know, and if you turn around and say, oh, you, 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 you're, you're ignorant, you're uneducated, you don't know what's good for you, you're stupid, you've been duped by Putin and Facebook, you know, this story that uh, the Democrats were pushing around in the United States that somehow Putin duped the American public into voting for, for, for Trump. I mean, I, I remember I was being interviewed on an, Amer an American uh, radio show and uh, television channel, I'm not sure, and I was asked, uh, Mr. Varfakis, are you denying that Putin tried to influence the American election? I said, no, but I tried to influence the American election. It just didn't work. You know, I failed. <laughs> so, anyway, so, yeah, that's one thing. We, that's what we should not be doing. What we should be doing instead, we should be um, answering the question, what needs to be done? You know, what, remember Lenin? What do we must do? And to put to them, a very clear proposal of a new deal that would work for them and to explain to them that, you know, if we had the levers of power, this is what we would do. This is where the money would come from. This is what we would pay for. This is how it works. This is hard work, but it's what the left has never done for many, many years. And this is what we are trying to do as DiEM25 here in Greece with Mera25, our Greek party. We're trying not just to say no, to what the establishment is doing, but, but to explain, if we were in power today, what we, we, we would do. What we would do today, in six months, in 12 months, in 24 months, in five years, in 10 years. Unless you can answer those questions, you've lost it. Um, and you, you, you talk about Keynes and the fact that, yeah, of course, of course we're perplexed when it comes to replacing capitalism. That's why I think it is important to put our minds together to answer the question of what comes after. That's why I'm talk I talked about the end of labor markets and share markets, because once you introduce one member, one vote, one share, you end both labor markets and share markets. This is why I talked about the end of banking. You know, be very specific of how you do it, you know, and, and what comes after it, and how does money work? Who determines the money supply? Uh, what about interest rates? I try to answer all these questions. Uh, and of course, I'm a, I don't have the perfect answers, but you know, I'm, I'm trying to, to think about it. And I think we should all do this together. The problem with Keynes was that he actually loved capitalism. Um, and he was a, you know, he was a liberal. He, he, was, he, he, he was just a very enlightened, clever capitalist, right? Who looked at capitalism and thought, oh my God, you know, the way it is being run, it's going to collapse. And then I'm, I'm going to be expropriated. I'm going to lose my privileges. So he understood that you've got to transfer wealth to the, to the many and to the poor in order to preserve, in order to save capitalism. This is where my, I differ from Keynes, even though I think that he he's, was one of the most revolutionary minds in terms of understanding the essence of capitalism. Um, and finally, you said something very, very correct, that we've got to learn from the failed left-wing experiments uh, from the Soviet Union, from Yugoslavia in particular. You know, the self-managed model was a great success in Yugoslavia. In the end, it failed. But, you know, it failed because it happened in one small country. I have a whole theory about why it failed in Yugoslavia. It had to do with uh, the debt, and especially debt to foreign bankers, and the way that the oil crisis uh, effectively made the macroeconomy of Yugoslavia collapse before the self-managed model collapsed. But that's a bigger story. Um, but I've got an aside here, um, which I also put in the book. The neoliberals, like von Hayek, were always lambasting socialists on the basis that um, to build socialism, you need to have a way of aggregating information. And his point was, it was a very interesting point, Hayek's point, anti-socialist point, that the market is the only way of aggregating information. Because, you know, I hardly know what I like. You know, I go into a shop and suddenly see something and I like it. I didn't even know I liked it until I saw it in the shop. So if I don't know what I like, how can society know what I like to serve me, to serve my interests? That, that, that's the Hayek point. Um, and only the market can 
combine our individual actions in a way that produces the information which is necessary to activate production and satisfaction of desires. That's the Hayek neoliberal argument. And then, you know, Amazon comes around and Netflix. I don't know whether you've noticed, I don't know whether it works for you. But when I go into Amazon to buy a book, you know, Amazon gives me suggestions about books that I really want. Amazon knows what I want. Netflix makes suggestions of movies and series that, you know, I'm interested in. And I would, which I would not. So it is possible to have central planning because, that, you know, what's Google? What's Netflix? It's a, it's a mini Soviet Union, right? It's totally, you know, ghost plan, centrally planned with a machine telling each one of us, working out what each one of us wants, my goodness. So, yes, it is. We have to learn from uh, ghost plan as well. Thank you, Yanis. I think we have time uh, for one uh, last uh, short question. Thank you uh, for uh, your questions, uh, Katarina, Katarina Podinata. I will let you in. Hello, and thank you for allowing me to ask a question. As I said, it's going to be very, very um, short and brief. Um, so my question is, um, how would you summarize civilizing capitalism looking like in a democratic post-capitalism of another now? Can you see, I didn't understand your question. Uh, how can civilize in capitalism? Um, how would you summarize yeah. civilizing capitalism looking like in a democratic post-capitalism of mm. another now, as you mentioned, another now, and it's a very interesting concept. So that's why I included it in my question. Thank you. Well, I don't believe you can civilize capitalism. Uh, and that's why in another now I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, 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 to picture uh, and to you know, describe a post-capitalist society. The reason why capitalism cannot be civilized is because if you think about it, from the very beginning of the transition from feudalism to capitalism, that's what you know, Polanyi was very good at explaining amongst others, um, you had a massive shift of power from the political sphere to the economic sphere. And it was only once power was completely removed from the political sphere to the economic sphere that you had democracy. In other words, you know, I, I, you know feminists understand very well how the, uh, once a profession that used to be powerful has become feminized, it loses its, 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 its status and it loses incomes. So once upon a time, you know, high school teachers were all men. And high school teachers were, you know, um, paragons, pillars of society. And their salaries were quite high by the standards of the time. Then the more women entered the teaching profession, the lower the status of the teaching profession and the less the salaries of the teachers. So, you know, um, similarly, when you shift power from the economic sphere to the, from the political sphere to the economic sphere, the bourgeoisie, the, the, the ruling class doesn't have a problem with the democratization of the political sphere since power has already moved the political sphere and it is in, in a wholly undemocratic sphere, which is the economic sphere, right? So the only way of civilizing, which is also democratizing society, is by merging the two spheres again bringing political power and economic power together and democratizing both, both kinds of power. But that means ending the distinction between those who own but do not work and those who work but do not own. And that means moving beyond capitalism. If you look at social democracy, social democracy was quite su su um, successful in the 1960s and 70s with the SPD in Germany, uh, in Austria, um, with the Labour Party in Britain, okay? with a great society that uh, Lyndon Johnson affected in 1965, reducing poverty significantly. But that succe succeeded uh, only uh, because of the Soviet Union and the fear of communism. Okay, once the fear of communism went away, suddenly everything was privatized again. And also, uh, only in the short run, because capital always finds ways of bypassing political constraints put in its, in its path. Uh, so in another now, I don't have a civilized version of capitalism, I have post-capitalism.
Unfortunately, I don't think we can keep uh, Yanis any longer uh, as the time we have agreed uh, upon run out. Uh, thank you again, Yanis. It was a real honor to have you with us today and I hope to see you soon in Belgrade at the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory. Uh, thank you, Gazella, and thank you to our audience for contributing to such a lively debate. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Hope to see you in Belgrade.